Hello, good morning, and welcome to News Central TV. My name is Mazino Appeal. The top stories at this hour. Nigeria Interpol collaborates to extradite fleeing Binance executive. Guinea's opposition insists on return to civilian rule by the year's end. Kenya in grip of medical standoff as strike continues. Details shortly. Now let's begin the news by telling you that Nigeria's army has pledged to redouble its efforts to ensure that terrorists and criminal elements have no breathing space in the country. This was made known by the chief of army staff while feasting with field troops at the Ford Operation Base in Rijana Kaduna State, northwest Nigeria. Ahmedin Uyi reports. The Guard of Honor at the Ford Operating Base in Rijana, Kaduna State, Northwest Nigeria. Senior military officials had visited troops on the field as part of efforts to encourage them. There was plenty to eat and drink, one of the rare occasions for many of these field troops. The Chief of Army Staff who was represented by the general officer commanding one division of the Nigeria Army, says that troops will redouble their efforts to ensure that terrorists and criminal elements have no breathing space in the country. Troops are always motivated to accomplish all statutory tasks. It is also an avenue to spare you up in order not to rest on your oars but to redouble your efforts in order to ensure that there is no safe haven left for terrorists and insurgents within our area of operation. He reiterated the commitment of the army to fulfilling its constitutional obligations to Nigerians. The Nigerian army remains committed, determined, and focused on ensuring the total defeat of insurgents, marauding bandits, and all other forms of external and internal aggressions disturbing the peace of the country. Also, the representative of the Kaduna state government promised to partner with the military, commending them for the rescue of the abducted Kuriga students. Commend you for your gallantry. We also appreciate your steadfastness as far as uh, the rescue of our students and pupils. We also want to assure you that we will continue to partner with you. We will continue to mobilize our citizens in ensuring that we provide the military with actionable intelligence as far as the campaign against banditry, terrorism, and other criminal acts are concerned. He assured the troops that government will stand in support of their efforts to rid the state of banditry. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Now, meanwhile, the Urubu Progress Union has demanded unconditional release of the OVA of Ewo Kingdom, His Royal Majesty Clement Ikulo Urupe I by the Nigerian Army over his alleged involvement in the killing of 17 soldiers in Okoma Community Delta State, South South Nigeria, on the 17th of March 2024. The President General of UPU, Chief S.A. Gam, made the call at a press conference held at the Union Secretariat in Wari, the economic nerve center of Delta State, South South Nigeria. The PG expressed the worry of the Urubu Progress Union over the development and wondered why the said persons were never invited for questioning over refused invitation from the military before they were declared wanted. Recall that the OVA of Iwo Kingdom and seven other persons were declared wanted by the Nigerian military over the Okwama killings. A rule. Professor and a king to be indulged or be involved in this kind of heinous crime, heinous crime where soldiers, high-ranking soldiers were butchered. They ought to know that. They ought to know that it is not for this group of people. These are not common felons. These are distinguished persons in their own rights. Then you just declare them wanted. And I say here and there, or now, on behalf of the UPU, Urobo people all over the world, that we demand 
an immediate release. We demand an immediate release of mostly this our king that surrendered himself. You see, there are certain times when you allow emotions to overrule you logically. It will make you a room for more problems. First and foremost, if a, a, the, the, the royal majesty surrendered himself and is being treated this way, what will even make the other people now to surrender themselves? Common sense logic. Because this decision is based on emotions. Based on emotions. The king came, here I am. If you want to uh, prosecute me, prosecute me. You threw him to, the, to, 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 to a, a den of, a, of a lions. What will make the other people that are invited to now come? Because they feel and they know, because there's this feeling of palpable fear everywhere. You know what a soldier is. So we, we, we want to appeal to the federal government to wade into the matter. The state government too, and the local government. Because we are not ready to take this matter lightly. Now Nigeria's federal government is in talks with the International Criminal Police Organization to extradite a top executive of cryptocurrency firm Binance, who escaped from detention on March 22nd. Nadim Anjouala, the fugitive in question, also, uh, rather along with another executive, Tigran Gambarian, were detained in Abuja over allegations of money laundering. Despite stringent security measures, Anjouala managed to flee the country using a Kenyan passport. However, the federal government insists that Andrewala's absence will not hinder the legal proceedings against Binance and Gambrayan, who are set to be arraigned in court on Thursday. Meanwhile, investigations into Andrewala's escape are ongoing as security personnel involved are being questioned by a special investigative team comprised of various agencies. And pro-transparency group, the Network Against Corruption and Trafficking Initiative has called on President Bola Tinumbu to prevail on the House of Representatives Committee on Public Petitions to commence investigation into petitions of corrupt embezzlement by officials in five government agencies. The network, while listing the agencies to newsmen in Abuja, say that some officials in the office of the Solicitor General of the Federation, the National Defense College, the Niger Delta Development Commission, the Nigeria Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the National Emergency Management Agency have questions to answer. Ahmedin Uyi reports. With Nigeria currently facing severe economic challenges, Many believe corruption in public service should be blamed for the current state of the nation. While the call has been made by several pro-transparency groups on citizens to join the war against corruption, pro-transparency group the Network Against Corruption and Trafficking Initiative says that it has uncovered several financial infractions performed by several and past government officials. Our mission today is to draw the attention of the public to our recent efforts to curb corruption in our beloved country, Nigeria. We have intercepted several financial infractions committed by persons in public office. These infractions include money laundry, massive corruption, gross abuse of public office, owning and running of private companies while in office, and false asset declarations. We have facts and figures. They are allegations. Though, okay, until proven otherwise by the, a court of competent jurisdiction. But our duty is to expose this thing. Let the anti corruption agencies take it. Representatives of NACAD say these officials have betrayed the trust of the public and should be thoroughly investigated. These people who are still worship report, they are not serving themselves, they are serving Nigerian people. Okay, and Nigerian people are entitled to know how they are being governed. But unfortunately, when they find themselves in the position of power, they arrogate power to themselves. They are calling on President Bola Tinubu to prevail on the National Assembly to also contribute to the war against corruption by inviting the suspects to give account of their stewardship. NACAT is hereby calling on President Ahmed Tinubu Bola to consolidate on this renewed trust for fiscal probity and governance accountability by prevailing and giving more impetus to the legislative to fight the horrendous financial activities of saboteurs in government. The group says petitions have already been submitted against the suspects and urge the House to live up to its responsibilities by bringing them to book.
In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Now, the Private Telecommunications and Communications Senior Staff Association of Nigeria has declared an indefinite strike effective midnight on Thursday, April 4. The union said the decision was deemed necessary due to the relentless anti-labor practices against field engineers perpetrated by subcontractors. The telecoms union disclosed this in a statement on Tuesday. According to PTE CSSAN, the subcontractors include Rhyme Group, All Stream Energy Solutions Limited, Upper Crest Limited, Tilium Nigeria Limited, and Specific Tools and Techniques Limited, which are purportedly engaged in projects awarded by Huawei Technologies Nigeria Limited. The union's demand include immediate recognition of employees' fundamental rights to association, acknowledgement of the union as the negotiating body for workers' welfare, and proper remittance of membership dues. Now to discuss this further, I am joined by the Secretary of the Private Telecommunications and Communications Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Abdullahi Okonu. Mr. Abdullahi, good morning. Good to have you here on the show today. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. Good. My pleasure to be here. Uh, first of my first two questions will be to give us a bit of clarity as to what exactly the union is about, your union is about. So first off, can we get a bit of clarity as to who comprises the Private Telecommunications and Communications Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, and what exactly the purview of the association is. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the Private Telecommunications and Communications Senior Staff Association of Nigeria is a trade union in the telecommunications sector, registered uh, specifically speaking in 2015 by the Registrar of Trade Union in the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Just like every other trade union in Nigeria, then the, the uh, it has jurisdiction within private telecommunications. By that, we are looking at uh, telecommunication companies owned by individual, private individuals, those companies that are not owned by the government, you know, so, and uh, all their staff that are graduates, that are professionals, mm. uh, are members. Okay, so that's good. Now, so the union said the decision uh, for the industrial action was taken due to relentless anti-labor practices against field engineers. What exactly are these anti-labor practices and uh, uh, what activities uh, uh, is the union speaking of exactly? Okay, thank you so much for that question. Maybe perhaps I should first and foremost start with uh, those that are statutory in nature before I go into other ones. Uh, the first and foremost, we are looking at this here by uh, uh, pension contribution uh, in our law in Nigeria today, as you know. Uh, we have this here by employers are expected to contribute 10% of whatever the employee is earning, and uh, while the employee is expected to contribute eight percent, meaning that, for for instance, someone that is earning one hundred thousand naira per month per month, uh, he, by the time the employer contributes ten percent, and uh, he also contributes eight percent, it means that uh, eighteen percent, that is eighteen thousand naira of hundred thousand naira should be in the contribute, pension contribution account of uh, the employee. So in this instance, you see that these employers, they have been stealing from our members for a very long time before we even got to organize them. You see a situation whereby people that are earning, say, uh, over 100,000 or uh, 200,000, as the case may be, you know, because of the nature of their job we have uh, and uh, how long they have been on the job, their salaries are expectedly uh, vary from one uh, employee to another. Mm -hmm. You see, if, like I give, the instance I give of 100,000 naira, 18,000 naira should be for the person that is earning 100,000 naira. You see, what they do here is giving them paying less than, seven, I mean, 1,000 naira. I mean, saving it in their contributory pension. And uh, this is statutory. It is statutory. Somebody that is earning 100,000 naira must have 18,000 naira in his PFA accounts. So in their own case, 
these employers, they have been stealing over from them over time. And we are saying enough is enough. Mm. So it's part of our requirement that uh, our demands that the most first and foremost starts contributing what they ought to contribute. It is statutory, like I've been saying. So there is, there is no hiding place for them. Okay. They must do what is expected of them by law. And apart from that also, their are health, uh, what do you call it, health insurance is not one that is uh, good enough. You know, you have a situation whereby they go to the hospital and uh, the, 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 the clinic or the hospital they go to for treatment, we tell them that whatever they, I mean, whatever treatment they are giving, that is in the excess of, uh, say, 15,000 naira. I mean, they cannot go beyond 15,000 naira, which is very, very wrong. And then what is expected in this country, as uh, required by law, is that whatever I mean, health uh, facilities they are going to put on ground must be, must cover not only the employee, it must cover his spouse, and at least, I mean, at, the, at least four dependents. But in their own case, not even they themselves is fully covered, not to talk of their spouses and their uh, dependents. And we are saying no, no to this. Then apart from that also, we are looking at uh, group life insurance. Because these guys, by the virtue of the, uh, by the nature of their job, they are expected to, to be going to the field by this it can be in the thick forest, it can be in the villages, you know. At end, they, they, they expect them to go out even at the wee hours of the night without uh, safety, without uh, protection whatsoever. You understand? And we are saying that they must provide their group life assurance for them. This also is statutory. Then, okay, then. let's okay. now go to... I, 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 because of time, I can't let you finish, um, but I, I want to ask one final question here. Now, should the um, action take place by midnight on Thursday, what exactly should we expect? What disruptions could Nigerians expect across the telecommunications systems? And how would this affect individuals, companies, uh, the economy at large? Basically, what is the extent to which this activity could affect us and our daily lives? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, what we have done is to try, despite the grievances we have, what we have instructed our, uh, our members is to just down to, to stop work. Meaning that they are not going to switch off anything whatsoever, maybe uh, they are very, at the various sites, they are not going to switch off. So, but during the course of their action, of their down, downing tools, if there is any form of outage, our members are not going to attend to them. So if, if they refuse by not attending to all those outages, automatically, it's in those areas that there are outages, there will be difficulty in making calls, there will be difficulty in, the, uh, what do you call it, in browsing in uh, the use of uh, internet. So uh, as it will affect individuals, automatically also, it will affect uh, also uh, companies as well. So perhaps, uh, what they should be doing now is to be praying that during the as uh, during the course of the industrial action there will not be outages. But if there is any outages, our members are not going to be attending to them. Well, thank you very much, Abdullahi. It was great to have your uh, word here on the news. Thank you indeed. Thank you so much. And now let's go on a break. And when we get back, we've got more news inside the hour. Yeah, welcome back. Now, Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, the FCT, Nielsen Wike, has described some leaders of the People's Democratic Party in River State as political buccaneers. Wike, who was uh, governor of the oil-rich South-South State from May 2015 to May 2023, berated PDP leaders in the state for declaring support for Governor Similayayi Fubara, PDP leader in River State. Abikek Sekibo, ex-PDP National Chairman Uche Sekundus, ex-Governorship Aspirant Celestino Mehia, and ex-Lawmaker Osno Para had last week declared support for Fubara and called on President Bolatinubu to caution Wike. However, reacting on Tuesday, Wike said Sekibo, Sekundus, Omehia, and Opara were all expired politicians not worthy to be called elder statesmen. 
And on to Kogi State now. Kogi State youths have united to safeguard their state's dignity in a bold stance against political malpractice. Representing all three senatorial districts, members of the Kogi Independent Youth Association convened in Abuja, issuing a stern warning to errant politicians. Emphasizing the need to preserve Kogi's unity and prosperity, they urged the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to remain vigilant against manipulative agendas. Mohammed Abdul Razak, speaking on behalf of youths, vows to resist any attempts to tarnish the state's image. Expressing confidence in the EFCC's integrity, they denounced political exploitation and affirmed their commitment to uphold Kogi's honor. The EFCC, we are here to caution the EFCC and to advise that they must be wary of those individuals whose intentions are not noble and who are out there to use the commission as a front for their to fight their political battles. There are some desperate Kogi, poli Kogi state politicians who are hell-bent on using the EFCC to fight or achieve their selfish political interests. Yeah. And we, as youth of Kogi State, we must not keep quiet on this because an injury to one is yeah. an injury yeah. to oh. all. We must not keep quiet on this. For a man who has done well for Kogi State, we know and they know that Governor Eabeno, the immediate past governor of Kogi State, has done well in the area of infrastructure. We know and they know that the former governor of Kogi State, Elijah Yabelo, has done well in the area of youth empowerment and youth inclusion and women inclusion in politics as far as Kogi State is concerned. We know and they know that Governor Yabelo has done well in the area of education, also lifting the face of our uh, institution in Kogi State. Yes, and of course, we must not pay him back at the hour where he, he has served the Kogi State diligently for eight years. Where he needs to have a rest now, we cannot pay him back with these bad coins, which we are here today to condemn our Kogi State politician, desperate Kogi State politician, and bitter Kogi State politician who feel they can divide the state along ethnic lines. We are saying no, Kogi State is one, and we are one united people. We will not allow them to. Nigeria's federal government says that in the last six months, over two million out of school children have been enrolled back into schools. This was made known by Nigeria's Minister of Education during a quarterly citizens and stakeholders engagement in Abuja, which x rayed achievements in the nation's educational sector. Our correspondent, Idong Joseph, reports. The maiden edition of a quarterly citizen and stakeholders engagement on Nigeria's education sector. The engagement aims to brief citizens and stakeholders on activities in the sector as well as sustain public trust and improve transparency and accountability. The Minister of Education, while presenting a paper on the achievements and deliverables of the ministry, says that over 2 million out-of-school children have been enrolled back to school in the last six months. In the last uh, one month or so, I have met with about 12 governors at least, and I have not seen a single one who is not excited about what is happening in the ministry and what we are on board because it is all for their own benefit. Also, you can see out of school children have the number that have been enrolled so far, about 2 million in various uh, areas in basic schools and Arabic literacy programs, vocational training. You can see about 2 million plus. While emphasizing the need for a joint approach in addressing the current learning crisis being witnessed at the basic educational level, the both ministers of education say preparations have reached an advanced stage to commence skills development of students. We have opened, constructed through the bank and commissioned a digital institute in Abuja. Here. The idea is to train our teachers across the country in the use of digital facilities in teaching. And right now we have close to a thousand teachers and the boy teaching. In terms of our constructions, which is also a major thematic area of our school, we have put much emphasis of recent to the innovation, to the construction of our vocational schools. So far, we have over 21 uh, schools that have been uh, completed, fully furnished, and that will be handed over to the state. The essence is to see that we can have the education we want. And the education we want right now is not an education that will just be based on paper qualification, that somebody cannot add value to himself or to the general public. He emphasized the need to get reliable and timely educational data at all levels, saying their ongoing efforts to build a database for the sector. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idong Joseph.
Now, it is believed that a major evidence of climate change is the usual global, in the usual global pattern. Now, residents of Joss Capital of Plato State, North Central Nigeria, are coming to terms with the rise in temperature and its attendant effects. New Central's Chizaba Anyanwe reports. Over the years, Plateau State had been known for its very cold weather conditions. This made it possible for certain plants that naturally thrive in cold environments to grow well with good yields on the plateau. The last few years may have begun a departure from that trend, leading to unusual temperature in the city. Available records focusing on March and April, which are the hottest months of the year, show that temperature in the city has been on a subtle rise as this year is going to be the warmest in Jos so far. Conversations around the changing weather pattern have been an ongoing global concern for years. Most of the identified causes are tied to human actions and inactions. Christian Ocha is a professor in the Climate and Meteorology Department, University of Jos. The natural um, energy that we get from the sun is there generally. But what is happening is more of anthropogenic factor, in that it is human, human factor. One, the population of Jos has increased. Activities as often have also increased. Activities in terms of commercial, transportation, all these things are the things that will give rise to excessive heat. No one can be the better judge of the seemingly strange temperature in Jos than the residents. It used to be very cold, but it's very, very hot. Like yesterday, I was sweating. My clothes have to be soaked. The weather is too harsh, especially now we are in Ramadan. The weather is too hot. And honestly speaking, we are not finding it easy. Like every extreme condition, the heat has direct effect on human health, which should not be ignored. Heat generally has an effect um, on the body. The immediate one is the um, extreme loss of body fluids. And of course, that leads to thirst. Thirst, of course, is your body telling you you need uh, more water. And of course, if you leave that unattended to, it leads to dehydration and even extreme forms of uh, dehydration. Some people actually uh, could faint or even have stroke um, from extreme exposure uh, to heat. Now, from the sights and sounds of this report, it is expected that more people will join the environmental advocates in the fight for the preservation of the world's heritage for the benefit of humans and animals alike. In JAWS for New Central. Coming up, Guinea's opposition calls for civilian rule by year's end. We'll be bringing you details after the break. And you're welcome back. Now, Guinea's opposition parties and civil society organizations are demanding a return to civilian rule before the year's end. In a statement released on Tuesday, the Force Vers de Guinea strongly criticized the military junta for delaying presidential elections originally scheduled for December 2024 as per an agreement with the Economic com Community of West African States. The opposition demands the restoration of public freedom and a return to constitutional order by December 31st, warning that it will no longer recognize the military junta beyond this deadline. The opposition further calls for the establishment of an independent electoral management body, a review of the constitution, and revisions to the electoral code. Tensions have been rising in Guinea as the deadline approaches, with opposition leaders accusing the junta of stifling dissent and harassment. Le gouvernement est dissous. Article 2. La gestion des affaires courantes. Now, the Kenyan government has urged medical professionals to bring an end to a nationwide strike that has paralyzed health worker service for three weeks. The Kenyan medical practitioners, pharmacists, and dentists' union, representing over 7,000 members, initiated the strike in mid March, citing grievances over pay and working conditions. Despite a court order to halt the strike, the union leaders remain steadfast. However, the government has announced measures to address some of the key concerns. In a statement released on Tuesday, the government pledged to fulfill certain demands, including the payment of arrears and budget allocation for hiring medical interns. But tension remains high as the strike enters its third week. The government is calling for compliance with the court's orders to end the industrial action.
And now, as the search for missing seven-year-old Jocelyn Smith has intensified, South Africa finds itself in yet another search as police in the Western Cape are seeking assistance from members of the public in tracing the whereabouts of 15-year-old girl Liema Moya, who was last seen by her mother on the 24th of uh, this month in uh, Zwelem Themba in Worcester. Liema and Jocelyn's story are just the tip of the iceberg of the scale of children who go missing in the country. According to the last figures released by the South African Police Service, missing persons, children go missing every five hours in South Africa. Children are also the most vulnerable victims of gender-based violence. Now to help unpack this, we are joined by National Coordinator at Missing Children South Africa, Bianca Van Atherken. Bianca, you're welcome. Good to have you here this morning. Thank you. Good. Now, first of all, Give us an idea of how rife is the current situation regarding missing children in South Africa, including the trend or patterns that have been emerging. Yes, children going missing in South Africa is of a great concern. As you mentioned earlier, the statistics shows one child every five hours, but that was released in 2013. So if we had such a problem in 2013, you can imagine what crisis we are facing currently with children going missing. We've got so many reasons why children go missing, but we've seen an increase with kidnapping cases and human trafficking in our country. So what's the rate of success when it comes to recovering or finding these missing children? Could you let us know? Is it what by percentage? What might it be? Unfortunately, like I said, statistics are currently unavailable, so it's very difficult to say what we actually looking at in South Africa, but statistics only gives us a general indication of the problem that we are facing. Mm. We've got c cases that go unreported due to people being too scared to go report cases, especially with the kidnappings, the families get threatened. We've got people in rural areas that are unable to get to police stations to open cases. So those that we know about is only a small amount of the cases that we see, never mind all the cases that go unreported in our country. Mm. That's very worrying. So what are some of the common reasons or circumstances that uh, lead to children going missing in South Africa? And what efforts are being made to address the root cause of these issues? We've got various reasons why children go missing. We get, have children that get lost. These are usually our mentally challenged children or over festive season, for instance, in shopping malls and down at our beaches. We've got kidnappings. Kidnappings happen for various reasons. We've got opportunistic kidnappings, kidnappings for ransom. We've got family abductions, parental abductions that happen. And then we've also got human trafficking. We've also got children that actually run away from home. But this is what we've seen is due to abuse. Children being abused at home that just cannot handle the situation anymore and they run off. But they just as vulnerable being outside on the streets for running away and there is assistance that can be given to them. So we as an organization work very closely with the South African Police Services to make sure that everything possible is being done to combat the problem that we are facing in our country. We've got specialized units within our Hawks human trafficking um, unit. We've got our anti-human um, anti trafficking unit that works specifically on human trafficking cases and kidnapping cases. But the problem doesn't lie with us as organization or the responsibility of the police. The safety starts at home. So we urge our parents and communities to look after our children. And that is where the safety starts. Mm. So Missing Children in South Africa, how do you guys support or what services do you guys make available for families and caregivers of missing children? How do, they, how do you guys ensure that they receive the assistance and guidance that they need during those stressful periods? So we as an organization deal with all types of missing persons cases throughout South Africa, whether it's a child or an adult. We support the families. We make sure that they kept updated. We do everything from our side to make sure that all these are followed up and to make sure that that person or child is found safely. It is a very traumatic situation to find yourself in that dire situation where your child has gone missing or family member has gone missing. So we do refer them to social workers in instances where children are abused at home. We've got trauma counselors that we refer them to to help them through the traumatic time that they've gone through or actually just helping them through to get through the case until they, uh, their child or loved one has been found. Well, Bianca, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you give us some details on the situation in South Africa.
Thank you. It's a pleasure. At least four people. Now, at least four people were killed and nearly 60 injured Wednesday by a powerful earthquake in Taiwan that damaged dozens of buildings and prompted tsunami warnings that extended to Japan and the Philippines before being lifted. Officials said the quake was the strongest to shake the island in decades and warned of more tremors in the days ahead. Strict building regulations and disaster awareness appear to have staved off a major catastrophe for the island, which is regularly hit by earthquakes as it lies near the junction of two tectonic plates. Wu Chengfu, director of Taipei's Central Weather Administration Seismology Center, said the quake was the strongest since a 7.6 magnitude struck in September 1999, killing around 2,400 people in the deadliest natural disaster in the island's history. On Tuesday, heavy floods were reported in the area of Lagasca, Quito, capital of Ecuador. The situation appears to be similar to that of January 2022 when the waters claimed the lives of more than 20 people. The waters began by taking Fulgencio Arujo and Antonio Jude Sucre Street, where neighbors notified authorities of the presence of large amounts of water and mud coming down the street. Mayor Pabel Munoz and management, uh, managers of technical teams from Quito are on the scene uh, attending to emergencies. Among the teams present are Fire Department, Public Enterprise, Mo Metropolitan Mobility, and Public Works, among others. The Metropolitan Transit Agency carried out closure on different cl uh, roads, such as Murisco, Sucre, and America, which, according to AMT, still have large vehicular and pedestrian flows. Eh, lastimosamente tenemos que informar una muerte confirmada. Eh, las afectaciones de viviendas no son tantas como eh, edificio y hubo desgracias. Afectaciones. Hay un muerto, hay un muerto y y bastante grave de las casas que están eh, inundadas y el edificio que está colapsando arriba. We have more news here on News Central TV after the break. Welcome back. And now let's join our business desk for update on business news. The Nigerian federal government has announced an increase in the price of natural gas for power generation companies. The new rate is set at $2.42 per metric million British thermal unit, up from the previous rate of $2.18 as Nigeria relies on gas-fired thermal power plants for over 70% of its electricity generation. This increase in gas prices may result in higher tariffs for power consumers. The Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority released the new domestic price, base price and wholesale prices for natural gas in 2024. The cost of commercial gas has also been raised to $2.92 from $2.05. The announcement was signed by the chief executive of the NMDPRA, Farouk Ahmed. Now, the South African Revenue Service exceeded February's revised budget estimates by nearly 10 billion rand, thanks to higher than expected corporate tax collections and efforts to combat reform fraud. SARS reported a net collection of 1.41 trillion rand for the tax year ending on March 31 surpassing the finance minister's revised estimate of 1.3 trillion rand. These higher than budgeted collections are expected to result in a slightly improved budget deficit compared to the revised estimates for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. The strong tax collections indicate a positive outcome for government's revenue and may contribute to better fiscal stability. We also tell you that the Central Bank of Liberia has extended the deadline for the currency exchange exercise to May 15, 2024. The decision was made after an emergency meeting of the CBL Board of Governors, considering challenges such as difficult road conditions and ongoing transitional processes. The old banknotes called the Liberian Series 1 and Liberian Series 2, printed before 2021, will remain legal tender until the new deadline. After May 15, commercial banks and rural community finance institutions will no longer accept the old banknotes for exchange. The CBL urges the public to take advantage of the extension and exchange their old banknotes. 
The extension aims to ensure a smooth transition to the new currency exchange system in Liberia. Welcome back and now time for sports. Now, Coach Randy Waldrum expressed confidence that the Super Falcons will overcome a 15-year uh, huddle and secure Olympic qualification at the expense of South Africa. The American coach lauded the current Super Falcons as a generational team poised to become one of the world's best. Emphasizing their focus on reaching Perry, Waldrum highlighted the team's depth and also talent showcased during the FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia. Despite acknowledging South Africa's prowess as defending African champions, Waldrum expressed belief in his players' capabilities. While missing key defenders Ashley Plumtree and Tosin Demehin, Waldrum remains optimistic, citing the squad's depth. The playoffs' first leg is set for the MKO Abiola National Stadium in Abuja, followed by the return leg in Pretoria five days later. Adam Petty declared his return to form after clinching the British 100-meter breaststroke title with the year's fastest time securing his spot in the Paris Olympics. Making a resounding comeback, Petty clocked 57.94 seconds in London, making his swiftest performance since defending his Olympic title in 2021. The world record holder, who endured a hiatus to address depression and alcohol issues, credited faith for aiding him through mental struggles despite setbacks, including a foot injury and a hiatus in 2023 to prioritize mental health. Petey's recent achievements signals his resurgence. At the 2022 Commonwealth Games, he finished fourth, but his stellar performance in London indicates a formidable re return. Petty's impressive time surpasses uh, his competitors, setting the stage for a, well, let's say, an anticipated showdown at the upcoming Olympics. And still more, in New Zealand, New Zealand's most experienced player, Sam Whitelock, will hang up his boots at the conclusion of the French club season in June. With 153 appearances for the All Blacks, Whitelock retired from international rugby after the World Cup final loss to South Africa last autumn. The 35-year-old, a double World Cup winner in 2011 and 2015, transitioned from France's top 14 with Paul last year. Reflecting on his decision, Whitelock uh, expressed a sense of closure acknowledging the ongoing desire to compete with a recognizing, while recognizing the stage of his entry. Renowned for his longevity and impact, Whitelock holds various records, including the youngest all-black to reach 100 tests and the second most capped men's international player. New Zealand head coach Scott Robertson hailed Whitelock uh, as uh, an icon of the, of the sport, emphasizing his indelible mark on rugby over four World Cup cycles. And that's all at this hour here for the news on New Central TV. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Nigeria, Interpol collaborates to extradite fleeing Binance executive. Guinea's opposition insists on return to civilian rule by the year's end. And we also told you that Kenya is in a grip of medical standoffs as strife continues. Now, more on that now, do remember that you can send your eyewitness report to the number on your screen currently. And do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV, Channel 422, Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV, and of course, on YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Mazino Appeal.